name is Chuck and I'll be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the UFG Insurance Fourth Quarter and Year End 2020 Financial Results Conference Call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to Randy Patton, Assistant Vice President and Controller. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining this call. Earlier today, we issued a news release on our results. To find a copy of this document, please visit our website at ufginsurance.com. Press releases and slides are located under the Investor Relations tab. Our speakers today are Chief Executive Officer Randy Ramlo, Mike Wilkins, Chief Operating Officer, and Don Jaffrey, Chief Financial Officer. Please note that our presentation today may include forward-looking statements as defined in the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. The company cautions investors that any forward-looking statements include risks and uncertainties and are not a guarantee of future performance. These forward-looking statements are based on management's current expectations. The actual results may differ materially due to a variety of factors, which are described in our press release and SEC filings. Please also note that in our discussion today, we may use some non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations of these measures to the most comparable GAAP measures are also available in our press release and SEC filings. At this time, I'm pleased to present Mr. Randy Ramlow, CEO of UFG Insurance. Thanks, Randy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our fourth quarter and year-end 2020 conference call. As we mentioned in our press release on February 11, 2021, our fourth quarter results were negatively impacted by social inflation, resulting in an increase in severity of current accident year losses and in prior accident year reserve strengthening. Social inflation continues to impact the entire industry. Unfortunately, our two largest states, Texas and California, are amongst the highest trending social inflation states, meaning the impact to UFG is magnified. In recognition of social inflation trends during 2020, and particularly in the fourth quarter, new commercial auto and general liability claims were reserved with more pessimism. Additionally, progress has been made to shorten the claim cycle, with reserves being established earlier in the process than in past years, with new analytic insights driving these outcomes. Also, during the fourth quarter, we reviewed the reserve adequacy of our open prior year accident year case reserves in consideration of our more pessimistic view. The full year of 2020 results were also negatively impacted by a historical level of catastrophe losses. Catastrophe losses added 13.5 points to the combined ratio in 2020, which is the highest in the last five years and significantly higher than our five-year historical average of 5.6 points prior to 2020. During the year, we experienced catastrophe losses of $231 million before reinsurance, $142 million net of reinsurance. The majority of these losses came from three significant events that occurred in some of our largest geographically exposed areas. Two of these events impacted Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the location of our corporate headquarters. These events were the August Midwest ratio with peak winds of 145 miles per hour and a hailstorm in April impacting the greater Cedar Rapids, Iowa area. The third event was Hurricane Laura, which impacted another heavy exposure area for UFG in southern Louisiana, the location of our 2019 Agent of the Year. Though we are very disappointed with our results in 2020, we remain optimistic about our future. Throughout 2020, we focused on building the foundation of our new strategic plan to improve profitability. Our strategic plan, which we call One UFG Boldly Forward, contains a number of initiatives aimed at long-term profitability, portfolio diversification, sustainable growth, and continuous innovation. As a result of our efforts, we are able to point to some early underlying improvements, including our fifth consecutive quarter with a decrease in the frequency of commercial auto losses and commercial auto exposure units. We also saw improvement in our core loss ratio, despite reserves being established earlier in the claim cycle and with more pessimism. 
Our core loss ratio improved 0.6 and 0.4 percentage points respectively in the fourth quarter and full year of 2020 compared to the same periods in 2019. Mike and Don will go into more depth in a few minutes of discussing additional positive outcomes from our strategic plan in 2020. Although the level and speed of improvement this year was unacceptable, we firmly believe that we are on the right path forward and will remain focused on improving profitability as a part of our strategic plan. In regard to the ongoing pandemic, as a reminder, nearly all of the policies we have issued contain contract language that specifically excludes business interruption coverage losses attributable, attributable to viruses such as the COVID-19 pandemic. At this time, we expect the effect of COVID-19 on claims currently under our coverages to be manageable. However, the pandemic continues to evolve, and we cannot predict how future legislation, regulation, or court actions will impact us. Before turning the call over to Mike, I want to mention that UFG reached an important milestone on January 2, 2021, our 75th anniversary. Though much has changed in our 75-year existence, we remain committed to our humble roots and founding belief that the insurance business is a people business. It was our founder, Scott McIntyre Sr., who instilled in the company the principle of doing business the right way and treating people the right way, a legacy I'm proud to say that is carried out daily by UFG employees across the country. I will now turn the call over to Mike Wilkins. Thanks, Randy, and good morning, everyone. My portion of the call discuss the progress of our strategic plan, focusing on the positive outcomes of the past year while addressing our 2020 results and our plans for improvement. First, as mentioned throughout 2020, our focus has been on reducing the size of our commercial auto portfolio by non-renewing underperforming accounts and reducing the number of exposure units. During 2020, we successfully decreased our commercial auto book, which now makes up 28.7% of our portfolio compared to 31.2% at the end of 2019. Looking at only new premiums on slide six in our slide deck, commercial auto accounts for 24% of the new premiums added in 2020 versus 32% in 2019. Our goal is to have a commercial auto represent closer to 24% of our portfolio mix, which we are achieving. Part of the strategy in balancing our book of business is also to improve our risk selection. In 2020, we established a centralized approach to underwriting, establishing consistency across our geographic regions using a broad brush in selecting risks in our strategic plan to balance our book of business. In 2021, we intend to be more targeted on where and what we write based on state and geographic region, especially focusing on the states that have the highest trends of social inflation, Texas, California, and Florida. With the sale of our personal lines renewal rights nationwide effective September 1, 2020, we believe we have reduced our exposure to the type of catastrophe events we experienced in 2020, especially near our headquarters. We remain disciplined on our pricing strategy, specifically on our commercial auto, property, and umbrella books of business. The commercial auto average renewal rate increase remained in the double digits at 10.5% in the fourth quarter of 2020. The commercial auto average 12-month rate increases have been in the low double digits since the beginning of the year. We continue to get the most rate in our bottom 30% of our retained commercial auto book. As a reminder, we are non-renewing a large percentage of our underperforming commercial auto business in the bottom 30% of our book. Commercial property improved in the fourth quarter with the average renewal rate increases now at 7.4%, up from 5.8% at third quarter. As we stated last quarter, we believe there is an opportunity with our commercial property book to be more aggressive with rate increases and reducing undesirable exposures as we see signs of the market hardening. From a claims perspective, our strategic plan focuses on shortening the claim cycle time, reducing legal expenses, and the impact of litigation. As Randy mentioned, the impact from social inflation for UFG is more significant than other carriers given the concentration of our book of business in Texas and California. Part of our strategy to address this is improving our legal and claims process. In the fourth quarter, we started to see the impact from the strategy of shortening claim cycles and setting case reserves earlier in the claims process and with more pessimism. Additionally, we recognize that increased specialization by our claims adjusters 
will allow us to deploy enhanced expertise on our most complex and severe claims. In the fourth quarter, as a precursor to specialization, we deployed a team of experts to review reserves on open claims leading to prior accident year reserve strengthening. We also deployed an analytics model for claim severity in the fourth quarter. This model assists our adjusters by identifying early and regular indicators of the severity of a loss. We expect to release a case reserving model for commercial auto by the third quarter of 2021 in continued support of our reserving accuracy. Additionally, we are pursuing opportunities for early but equitable settlements, reducing the tenure of our open claims. I will wrap up my portion of the call today discussing some of our growth strategies. Our strategic plan is to grow and expand our profitable lines. Our most profitable lines in 2020 and the lines we believe present us with the greatest opportunities are surety and ENS. Both our surety and ENS lines exceeded the profitability and written premium goals in 2020. Our plans are to continue to grow these lines in 2021. For ENS, this includes state and product expansion, and for surety, this includes additional surety producers in the Northeast U.S. Another historically profitable line that we intend to grow is assumed reinsurance. Growth in this line will allow diversification of our current portfolio mix. We have several new assumed reinsurance programs in place in 2021 that will diversify our overall book of business. Lastly, in mid-2021, we are excited to begin the initial rollout of a new online quoting experience for our agents, allowing us to increase our straight-through processing of policies and grow our profitable BOP line of business in the future. With that, I'll turn it over the discussion to Don Jaffrey. Don? Thanks, Mike, and good morning, everyone. In the fourth quarter, we reported a consolidated net loss of $8.9 million compared to a net loss of $23.2 million in the same period of 2019. For the full year of 2020, we reported a consolidated net loss of $112.7 million compared with net income of $14.8 million for the full year of 2019. As Randy and Mike mentioned, the quarterly results were impacted by severity of losses from what we believe to be the influence of social inflation and prior accident year reserve development. During the fourth quarter, we recognized unfavorable prior accident year reserve development of $12.4 million, primarily driven by our commercial liability and auto liability lines of business. For the full year of 2020, we had favorable development of $17.7 million compared to favorable development of $5.3 million for the full year of 2019. As a reminder, we have had continued favorable prior accident year reserve development every year since 2009. Catastrophes were significant and impactful on results during 2020, with results of $142 million compared to $64.4 million for the full year of 2019. Also contributing to the fourth quarter net loss was the continued impact in severity of losses. Moving on to investments, we reported an improvement in the fourth quarter for both realized investment gains and net investment income. This is primarily due to an increase in the fair value of our investment portfolio, recovering a portion of the realized losses and decline in investment income from the first three quarters of 2020. In the fourth quarter of 2020, the fair value of our investments in equities, or what I refer to as phantom gains, increased 32 million pre-tax compared to 4.4 million increase in the fourth quarter of 2019. And net investment income increased 0.9 million in the fourth quarter compared to the fourth quarter of 2019, primarily due to an increase in fair value of our limited liability partnerships or our bank funds. Our bond portfolio also increased in 2020 with an after-tax unrealized gain of 36 million during the year. Despite these improvements in the fourth quarter, we reported net realized investment losses of $32.4 million and a decline in net investment income of 34% for the full year of 2020 compared to the full year of 2019. We have reduced some of the volatility in the investment portfolio with the sale of equities we undertook this year. As for our operating metrics for the quarter, we reported a combined ratio of 123.1% compared to 117.9% in the same period of 2019. For the full year, we reported a combined ratio of 115.9% compared to 109% for the full year of 2019. We did see a decrease in the expense ratio in the fourth quarter of 2020 to 30.8%. 
from 32.2% reported in the fourth quarter of 2019. The decrease is primarily the result of a decrease in commission. For the full year of 2020, the expense ratio was 33.5% as compared to 32.6% for the full year of 2019. The increase of less than one point was primarily due to our continued investment in technology initiatives. We have several expense initiatives as part of, our, part of our strategic plan, including a change in our agent commission structure, the establishment of a vendor management office, and a shift in the design of our pension and retiree medical benefit plan. In the second half of 2020, we began to see some impact from changes to our commission structure. These changes included an adjusted agency commission schedule, aligning with the profitability of our lines of business, and an adjusted agency profit sharing plan emphasizing profit over volume. These changes will have a greater impact in 2021. We also established a centralized vendor management office in 2020 to better track and manage our vendor contracts. We believe this approach will provide opportunities for further negotiation of contracts and ultimately additional cost savings going forward. For the pension plan, we made the decision at the end of 2020 to transition from a traditional defined benefit pension plan to a cash balance pension plan, which significantly reduced our long-term liability and our volatility in the potential benefit obligation. This had a positive impact on equity in 2020 and will have a positive effect on our expense ratio beginning in 2021. In addition, we just announced the difficult but necessary decision to change our retiree medical plan to a voluntary plan funded exclusively by participants, commencing at the start of 2023. We are currently working through the financial reporting and accounting implications of this decision. Our expectations are that this decision to end the employer-provided funding for the retiree medical plan will have a short-term benefit to the expense ratio in 21 and 22, with the greatest proportion of the impact to 2021. Longer term, we expect this action will provide some additional savings to the ongoing escalating cost of benefit expenses for UFG. For reference, the retiree medical plan liability at December 31st, 2020 was about $32 million. This existing obligation will be recaptured along with releasing prior credits into the income statement over the next two years. Although dependent on premium levels, with these expense management actions, our expectation is that our expense ratio will be lower in 2021. With a conservative estimate for the ratio to decrease by approximately two points for our 2021 performance year. We will provide a more definitive number during our first quarter 2021 conference call, following the completion of the required accounting and actuarial evaluations of this change in the retiree medical plan. Moving on, I will end my portion of the call by discussing capital matters. As of December 31st, 2020, I am pleased to report that we continue to maintain a strong balance sheet to support our business and our One UFG Strategic Plan initiative. At the end of 2020, we made the decision to leverage our balance sheet by adding $50 million of long-term debt with the addition of two surplus notes from a privately negotiated transaction. The new instruments result in a small impact to our capital structure, with UFG now holding 6% in terms of a debt-to-equity ratio. This decision to add additional debt capital will support the profitable growth initiatives Mike discussed as part of our One UFG strategic plan. Also, during the fourth quarter, we declared and paid a $0.15 cent per share cash dividend to shareholders of record as of December 4, 2020, marking our 211th consecutive quarter of consistently paying dividends dating back to March of 1968. Lastly, during the quarter, we did not repurchase any UFCS shares. We made the decision in mid-March to suspend share repurchases. We remain authorized by our board of directors to purchase an additional 1.8 million shares of common stock under our share repurchase program, which will expire at the end of August 2022. And with the closing of our prepared remarks, I will now open the line for questions. Operator? Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star than one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star than two. And at this time, we'll pause momentarily to assemble our roster.
And the first question will come from Paul Newsom with Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Um, good morning. Thanks for the Great call. Ball. Hope everyone's well. Um, I was hoping you could give us a little bit more details on what you call uh, social inflation. Um, is it very much specific to commercial auto? Um, and is there any sort of additional details to the kinds of lawsuit severity that you are seeing that would um, give us a sense of what might be going on? So, Paul, I'll start with this one, and then maybe Corey will chime in a little bit from, uh, you know, the claim side. Um, I think we've kind of mentioned that, um, you know, a couple of the states that uh, show up in the press, um, you know, as being, you know, the more difficult ones uh, in Texas and California are, unfortunately, you know, our two biggest states. So, you know, we have a bit of a problem right there. Um, yes, commercial auto has been, you know, a huge target, you know, kind of by the uh, plaintiff's bar. Um, you know, kind of workers' compensation maybe was at one time, but a lot of the kind of uh, scheduled limits on uh, compensation has made that less attractive. Uh, but uh, commercial auto and, um, you know, especially autos covered with an umbrella, um, you know, are, have been real targets. And, um, you know, it's not just necessarily jury or um, judgment awards, but, uh, you know, two things we see, you know, that we used to see in claims that were, were somewhat unique, uh, which is traumatic brain injuries and then post-traumatic stress syndrome. And it is amazing on what percentage of really even low impact claims that we see both of those. Uh, we've kind of talked a little bit about our um, analytics tools and, you know, those tools pick out characteristics of claims that um, uh, translate into a high likelihood that, uh, you know, A, there will be litigation and uh, B, adverse litigation. And those are, you know, two terms that, uh, you know, really stick out. So, you know, where that's coming from, if it's, you know, physicians are more likely to, you um, uh, diagnose those two conditions, uh, but both of them, you know, kind of translate into possible bigger payouts. So, you know, a lot of it is um, juries and judges ignoring uh, negligence, but also it's, um, you know, kind of the propensity of these these uh, kind of injuries. So, uh, UFG, you know, yes, auto is a big target, auto with umbrellas. Uh, unfortunately, we have a large percentage of our book in auto uh, and considerably above uh, a lot of our peers. And as I think Mike mentioned, we're, we're working on getting that uh, more in line. And then we're also in kind of some of the, you know, the worst states. Uh, so those two both um, have uh, uh, been very adverse to UFG. So maybe I'll ask Corey if he wants to chime in here a little bit with some uh, more information on just claims specifically. Hi, Paul. This is Corey Ruley. Uh, if you look at our social inflation on an overall basis, it's running right in line with what the industry is, is uh, seeing as well. If you break out commercial auto for California and Texas, it's about about double that um, year over year over the last five years. We are seeing some positive results, though. Um, our new suit counts uh, starting in, in January of 2019 until now have uh, been dropping steadily. But if you look at those new suits, California and Texas run almost half of the total um, uh, for, for overall new suits. Um, our closing cycle time on, on those suits has continued to be um, very steady. And so what we've created is a nice gap between the number of new suits coming in and uh, the number of closed suits that uh, we, we're still uh, maintaining. Our payment cycle time has also improved uh, over the last few years, which to me is a good leading indicator that we're actually getting out ahead of these claims. We've also been uh, tracking um, for new commercial auto BI claims that come in in a given quarter, uh, what, what level of reserving that we're establishing on those claims. And, and I can tell you that we've almost doubled uh, where we were at traditionally uh, starting in the third quarter of 2019 and all of 2020. So we're making really good progress there. As Randy had mentioned, we, uh, we also instituted the uh, severity model in the, in the fourth quarter of uh, last year. And that severity model has allowed us to be able to triage uh, these claims to, to the right uh, adjusters right off the bat so that we're uh, getting out ahead of these claims 
and uh, seeing improved settlements. If you look at social inflation um, on claims that are uh, open longer than two years versus those claims that were, were able to close in less than a year, uh, the gap is continuing to widen there too. So the longer a claim is open, uh, especially if it's in litigation, uh, we're seeing quite a bit more inflation there. Great. So um, my second question um, regards to the, the math of the uh, the, in the, the uh, fund raising of those $50 million of uh, surplus in this debt. Um, could you kind of uh, put together the pieces of, of why um, $50 million would be needed to fund growth when it looks like the book is actually going to shrink, at least on a revenue basis, um, because of your underwriting initiatives? So maybe we'll let Dawn tell you a little bit about uh, uh, she was most heavily involved in uh, the surplus notes, so I'd let her kind of give a little background. Sure. I'll, I'll make a couple pom comments here, Paul, and then I'll uh, ask Mike to weigh in as well. Um, you know, clearly uh, our growth opportunities uh, looking forward, uh, it made sense for us to add some additional um, what's treated for uh, insurance purposes as capital, as you know, in the form of a surplus note, yet on a gap basis it's treated as uh, debt. And uh, we thought it was an opportunistic time to add a very small amount uh, that was uh, to support our uh, various One UFG plan initiatives. Yeah, Paul, this is my. Uh, you're, sorry, Paul. Um, you, you are accurate that we expect to um, see premium shrink uh, going forward. However, we do have some areas that uh, we um, plan to uh, try to grow uh, fairly aggressively, um, areas that have been you know, extremely profitable for us in the past and we think represent good opportunities uh, going into the future. And the, you know, the, the main areas there would be our surety operation. Um, excess surplus lines and assumed reinsurance. Uh, we've um, uh, you know, set out fairly aggressive growth goals in those areas and um, felt this was a good move to make sure we have that adequately supported. So is this an, uh, a desire to end up putting cash in the right spot for that particular segment of growth or is it just uh, I guess I'm still not if if the business is shrinking, wh why do you need more surplus capital? Maybe we can take it offline. I'm I wondering how the math think, works. We're doing. Thanks, Paul. You know, I think that the main point is just um, continuing our historical approach to re retaining a you know a strong balance sheet uh, and being prepared for the future. As you're aware, this is a very small amount um, relative to our overall. Um, capital structure, and we've had no debt type instruments, uh, and the uniqueness of this opportunity being a surplus note uh, was was also part of the draw for us. Great. Okay, thank you. I'll let some other people ask questions if they have one. Appreciate the call. Hope you guys are well. Thanks, Paul. The next question will come from Marla Backer with Sedoti. Please go ahead. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions um, in part a follow up to what uh, the discussion just you know uh, talked around. First, during 2020, we obviously saw a lot of delays, if not outright closures um, um, in the courts. Um, do you think there's any uh, impact of that? in terms of what you're seeing that makes you more pessimistic now in the social uh, inflation? Um, so again, maybe this is Randy, maybe I'll make a quick comment and then ask Corey if he has any um, thoughts. Um, kind of early on, I think we did, we, we saw some uh, willingness um, to uh, settle claims early on in the pandemic. Um, I'm not sure that has necessarily lasted on, but uh, you know, kind of from everything we're seeing, most people are predicting this, you know, kind of not to be a short-term fad, but uh, uh, it's kind of just baked in, um, you know, another uh, factor, you know, income inequality, that's, you know, uh, what a big driver is in, in states that have 
the largest income uh, gaps are also where a lot of the um, big judgments are coming out of, you know, some calling them uh, nuclear judgments. We haven't necessarily had that much problem with that. Ours is more, um, you know, a percentage is kind of being added on to uh, what a normal judgment would have been, you know, four or five years ago. So, um, you know, I think, you know, some of the courts are, are getting ready to um, to start to open up, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if the pandemic has had much uh, overall effect, you know, on social inflation itself. I think it's just more of kind of a changing attitude of society. Corey, do you have any comment? Hi, Marla. Um, when we look at some of the leading indicators uh, that uh, have, have kind of driven uh, where we're at with social inflation, a lot of those were, were we were seeing good signs prior to the pandemic even starting. And I had mentioned That's our new So I had mentioned our new suits dropping. And even with the pandemic, the rate of drop um, on a year-over-year -year basis has continued to be uh, pretty steady. So it wasn't a, a sharp drop off uh, when, when the pandemic started there. It will be interesting to see though as courts open up um, what happens there uh, to see if, if there are changes in the way people approach things. But we're still taking a, a very fair but very aggressive approach to getting claims settled as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then in terms of higher reserving um, and earlier reserving, um, does that mean that we should expect to see that trend continue at least until we, you know, sort of anniversary this slight uh, shift in your strategy vis-a-vis -vis reserve? We're going to continue to uh, review claims on a regular basis. Uh, one thing about social inflation is it is a moving target and that uh, claims are changing on a daily basis. And so it's important for us to do, continue to do a constant review and there could be some continued development uh, into 2021, but there'll be uh, more to come there. Okay. And Marla, this, and is, this is uh, Randy. Oh, go ahead. This is Randy no, again. Sorry. I, uh, you know, one kind of further comment I would make is usually when you hear of uh, reserve strengthening, um, you know, you look to that the reserve was maybe put up incorrectly. And uh, I think what we're more seeing is, you know, just that the game has kind of changed. Um, the reserves we may have put up a year or two ago were kind of adequate for the times. But as we have kind of seen things settle and develop, um, as we mentioned, we've just come, become a bit more pessimistic on, you know, what it's going to cost to settle some of these claims. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Okay, my last question. I'm actually switching topics now. You talked before in your uh, prepared remarks about uh, introducing uh, an online platform for your uh, agents sometime in mid-2021. Can you uh, expand a little bit about, uh, on the platform and also talk about the potential perhaps at some point down the road to uh, expand its functionality a bit to uh, possibly offer some direct-to-consumer um, uh, you know, offerings? Thank you. So, Marlo, this is uh, Randy. Um, we, we probably will respectfully not touch the uh, going direct to consumer uh, question right now because <laughs> um, we could uh, make some enemies with that. But uh, I think I'll let Mike tell you a little bit uh, about our platform. He uh, has a good handle on kind of what some of them we will offer. Hi, Marlo. Mike uh, Wilkins here. Um, so, yeah, a little bit more um, information about the the um, initiative. Uh, we are going to uh, release that as a pilot in uh, April, so not that far away, but expect a broader release uh, to seven states uh, mid-year. Um, it's a uh, product that um, is aimed at the um, small business segment, so the uh, often referred to as the BOP segment in insurance, the business owner's uh, policies. Um, we will expand uh, to additional states about every three or four months um, you know, after that initial mid-year uh, release. Um, the um, user interface is very intuitive. Um, it's been uh, built to be very flexible. It's, uh, you know, we we uh, market 100% through independent agents, and the um, tool was built in collaboration with our agents to support them um, issuing that business. Now. Um, what is common in the business owner's um, segment is 
uh, a lot of that business is handled in our service center. So we have a service center that provides a lot of the servicing for the agents. And we've also designed the system to uh, make servicing of that business easy and also allow the insurance to do some of the self-servicing -service of that business as we go forward. So it's very flexible. It will allow us a lot of um, opportunities to change the way we do business with the insureds and with the agents um, over time. Um, and we're, we're pretty excited about it. Okay, thank you. Again, if you have a question, please press star, then one. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Randy Patton for any closing remarks. Please go ahead, sir. This now concludes our conference call. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's program. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. You may disconnect your lines.